Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia and Bridget share the secrets to perfect Boston cream pie. Adam shows Julia his top pick for silicone spatulas. And Aaron makes Bridget foolproof chocolate sheet cake. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. is a legendary hotel right here in Boston. It's where Charles Dickens first recited A Christmas Carol. It's where John F. Kennedy held his bachelor party. And it's also the birthplace of the one and only Boston cream pie. <laughs> I can't compete with JFK. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Actually, the Boston cream pie comes close. It really does. And, and it is kind of Boston's pride. You have that sponge layer with the pastry cream right in the middle. Of course, it's all covered with a beautiful chocolate ganache glaze. Mm. All right, so let's start with the pastry cream. Okay. So I have here six egg yolks. And actually, I've put this right over a towel. This is a nice damp towel. Just rolled it up, put it in a ring. And this is going to hold the bowl when I go later on to whisk a little dairy A nest in here. for your eggs. Exactly. <laughs> now we're going to add a half a cup of granulated sugar and a pinch of salt. A little bit of salt goes a long way, but it really helps to balance flavors. And we're going to go ahead and whisk this until it's nice and smooth. All right, so now it's time to add the thickener. Now we're using flour. This is a reliable thickener. It's going to hold its shape. It's going to really help that pastry cream get nice and thick. So this is a quarter cup of all-purpose flour, and we'll whisk this as well. We're using flour to thicken our pastry cream rather than cornstarch because flour is a more stable thickening agent. Here's why. The starch molecules in both the flour and the cornstarch absorb water when heated and eventually burst, creating a thickening network of amylose molecules. The trick here is the egg yolks in the custard also contain an enzyme, but it's called amylase, and that breaks down the amylose. If too much breakdown happens, the custard will never set. And since cornstarch is pure starch, Flour is a safer bet because in addition to starch, it also contains some protein and a small amount of fat, which helps prevent the egg enzymes from breaking down the starch. And that's why flour is the best thickening agent for this pastry cream. So let's move on over to our dairy. I've got two cups of half and half here, nice and rich. Brought it up to a simmer over medium heat. We're going to take a half a cup of this and we're going to use this to temper those egg yolks because what we want to do is bring up the temperature of the egg yolks so that they don't scramble. So now all this can go right back into that pot. Now I'm going to put it back over medium heat, and we're going to cook this just for about a minute. It's going to start to thicken very quickly. Now I do want to keep whisking it. All right, so this is just starting to get some body, thicken up just a little bit. So I'm going to turn the heat down to medium low, and I'm going to whisk this for about eight minutes. And what we want is a lot of that moisture to evaporate, and we want to activate the flour. All right, so you can see what eight minutes does. This is super thick. We're going to cook this just for about another minute more. I'm cranking the heat up to medium. The thick pastry cream is great here because that way it won't leak out between the layers of cake. Exactly. The sides are exposed on a Boston cream pie, so you don't want to see a lot of dripping pastry cream. This is going to come off the burner. This is four tablespoons of unsalted butter. And as the pastry cream chills a little later on, that butter's going to re-solidify and help give it even more body. And this is one and a half teaspoons of vanilla extract. So we'll whisk this in. We're going to go ahead and strain this through a fine mesh strainer. And that's going to catch all those little lumps. All right, that is looking good. Now we need to refrigerate it, but we want to make sure that a skin does not form on the top. So got a little bit of vegetable oil cooking spray on the parchment. Make a little circle. I'm going to press this right on the surface of the pastry cream. There we go. And now this is going to go in the fridge. You want to leave it in there at least two hours so it can cool down. But you can actually make this up to 24 hours in advance. On to the second component of our Boston cream pie. It's cake. I know, right? <laughs> well, actually, back in the day, cake and pie were the same thing. It had to do with the dish it was baked in. The same dish made pie, made cake. So they called it a cake or a pie. It didn't matter. Makes sense. I call dinner and dessert the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're using kind of a sponge cake. We're not using the traditional Genoise style sponge. And that is a foam cake. And it's only leavened by beating eggs with sugar. And you get that nice, puffy foam. Actually, it can deflate very quickly, and also it's not very rich. We want a little bit more richness to kind of counter the sweetness of all the other components. So we're making a very close relative called a hot milk sponge. This is three-quarter cup of whole milk and six tablespoons of unsalted butter. We just melted it over low heat, and now I'm going to add one and a half teaspoons of vanilla extract. Just swirl that in. If you could put the lid on, 
We're gonna leave that to the side. It's gonna stay nice and warm. This is one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. And we have one and a half teaspoons of baking powder. This is our insurance that this cake is gonna not only lift, but it's gonna stay risen and not deflate. This is three quarter teaspoon of salt. And we'll whisk this together. All right, so now let's move over to our electric mixer. This is three whole large eggs and one and a half cups of granulated sugar. Now we're gonna beat this on high speed until it's nice and foamy and very pale. That's gonna take about five minutes. That looks beautiful, it's all puffy and airy. We're gonna mix in our hot milk mixture, just pouring it right in here. Oh, that vanilla, you can smell it again as it's getting mixed into that batter. And now our dry ingredients. Boy, this cake really is easy. It's super easy. And now I'm just whisking it until I know that all the dry ingredients are combined. These are two nine inch cake pans. We've gone ahead and greased them, sprayed them with a little bit of vegetable oil spray, parchment in the bottom. I'll divide it between the two pans. There we go. Now, these are going to go right into a 325 degree oven. We're gonna bake these for about 20 to 22 minutes. And what we're looking for, a toothpick inserted right in the center is gonna come out clean and the tops are gonna be nice and light brown. Sandra B. wants to know, what's the most accurate method for measuring out ingredients? Well, the most accurate method is using a scale. It's always going to be spot on. Now, to use a scale, you take a container, you put it right on the scale, and then you want the display to read zero. So you're either going to hit the zero button or your scale may say tear. That's going to bring it to zero. And then you simply pour in your ingredients until you've reached the desired amount. Now, what do you do if you don't have a scale? Well, you can use what the test kitchen calls a dip and sweep method. Very easy to do and kind of self-explanatory. Simply take your measuring cup and dip it lightly into, in this case, flour, and then scrape right over the top in one fell swoop. And this is going to give you the most accurate reading without a scale. All right, our cakes are nice and cooled, and I know that they're cool because if I put my hand right on the bottom. <laughs> it doesn't burn off. <laughs> it's not gonna singe at all. Really important to always cool cake layers before you frost them, fill them, or ice them. And since we're using a nonstick pan, I'm gonna use you know, something left over from my last picnic, just a regular <laughs> plastic knife. And we'll go right around the exterior. All right, so now I'm going to flip this out onto a wire rack. And now we'll go ahead and peel away the parchment. So now I'm gonna reinvert this cake, pretty side up. And there we go. And I'll do the same thing with the second cake. We're gonna start assembling this and there's a pedestal over there. Here you are. That's how highly we think of Boston cream pie. <laughs> to be raised up from its lowly beginnings up onto a pedestal. We're gonna center that on our plate and I'll peel the parchment off of our pastry cream. And we do need to loosen it up just a little bit. So I'm gonna take a whisk. That looks a bit more spreadable. Let's pile the pastry cream right into the center. Now, I'm gonna take an offset spatula and just start working out towards the sides of the cake. All right, so that is looking good and smooth. Second layer goes right on top. In a moment, we're gonna make our glaze, but in the meantime, we're gonna go put this in the fridge. All right, the final part of our Boston cream pie trifecta, or piefecta, <laughs> I'm gonna start calling it now, and that is the chocolate glaze. The best part in my opinion, <laughs> I must say. But we wanted a glaze that we could really count on. We didn't want it to be too brittle because when we cut into it, we don't want it to break off like a shard, it might poke our eye out. <laughs> and also, we didn't want one that would not set up. You'd be surprised how many of them are too loose. So this is very dependable, nice and flexible. So I've got a half a cup of heavy cream over medium heat. Now this is the magic ingredient. It's mm -hmm. two tablespoons of corn syrup. This is going to give our ganache a little bit of flexibility, but it's not so much that it's going to make it too spreadable and too thin. We have achieved simmer. So we're gonna take it off the heat and add four ounces of bittersweet chocolate. It's chopped nice and fine. Pour this right in there and I'll whisk it until that chocolate is melted. That's going to take about 30 seconds. Now, could you substitute, say, a milk chocolate or a semi-sweet chocolate here if you wanted? Absolutely, yeah, it really is a matter of preference. But with the sugar and the pastry cream, sugar and the cake, a little bittersweet chocolate is great. We're gonna let this sit here off heat for about five more minutes. All right, so our ganache has thickened up just enough. Mm. Down a little bit too. 
we're gonna glaze this pie cake. <laughs> we're gonna pile all this right in the center. Hello, gorgeous. Now, using an offset spatula, go ahead and push it out towards the sides. Work my way around, and then you're gonna see it start to fall. Oh, Hello. chocolate waterfall. Chocolate waterfall. Now you wanna leave plenty on the top. Little drips, big drips. That's all I'm going to do. Now this is going to go into the fridge, and here's the bad news. This needs to set up and really get chilled. That's gonna take at least three hours, but you can make it up to a day in advance, and it's perfect to serve. Time's up. All right, let's eat our pie cake pie. <laughs> a nice slab of this, because why not? Oh, make it a small slice. <laughs> Check that out. Beautiful, thick layer of pastry cream. Yeah, you're checking it out right now. Tell that. <laughs> oh, the cake has the perfect consistency. And you can see why that pastry cream is so thick. It actually plays great with the cake here. And what's great, it's not too sweet. Mm -mm. This was a good invention. This was a great invention. So to make a famous and foolproof Boston cream pie at home, start by making a pastry cream with half and half and a little flour. Then spread the cream between two layers of hot milk sponge cake and finish with a glossy chocolate glaze. And there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, the ultimate recipe for Boston cream pie. No matter if we're baking or cooking, scrambling or sauteing, flipping or folding, a heat-proof silicone spatula is one of the busiest tools in our test kitchen. And Adam's here to tell us which spatula is the absolute best. Julia, this is the one that we've been using in the test kitchen for years. Mm -hmm. You probably recognize this. I know this. it well. It won our last spatula testing. It's the Rubbermaid High Heat Scraper. But you know, there has been grumbling amongst the test cooks in the oh, test kitchen I've that heard it's it. a little too big. That sent us back to the drawing board here. There are a lot of spatulas out there. We narrowed it down to this lineup of 10 that you have in front of you. The price range was $6.95 at a low to $18.67 at a high. There were 14 separate <laughs> tests, but there were- Spatula Olympics. It was spatula palooza. The categories were folding, stirring, scraping, versatility, durability, and cleanup. There are generally two parts to a spatula, <laughs> the blade and the handle. Let's talk about the blades first. This one turned out to be a little bit too small for maximum efficiency in terms of folding and stirring. It just didn't move enough food in one swipe. However, if you had a really large head, then you would move plenty of food, but it didn't reach into the corners of, say, a measuring cup or a small bowl as easily. You want something that's kind of in the middle there, like this one, which is about four inches. Hmm. Now, a second thing is the shape of the blade. This one, for instance, has a sharply angled top edge so that when you're scraping, your point of contact is just that corner. Very small. Like that. Not very efficient. What you would rather have is a little more contact because you have a flatter angle right there. Now, also, the surface of the blade made a difference. You know when you're folding away, say, a cookie dough or something sticky, and it's on the blade, and you run it across yes. the rim of the ball? If you have, take, take that one at the end. If you have something like uh -huh. that that has a really deep ridge, food gets lodged in there, and it takes a few swipes to scrape it off. I hate it when that happens. It's extra work. Whereas if you have something smooth, like this one, one swipe, all the food is off there. The last thing is the sort of compromise between flexibility and rigidity. Why don't you try these two? You all know, right. if you are scraping the fond off the bottom of a skillet. Ooh, it, he's mushy. Exactly, you I, don't want it to fold over on itself. You want a little rigidity there, but you don't want it too hard. Testers really like this one, yep. found that one just too mushy like yeah. you did. You know, ergonomists have this phrase called <laughs> affordance, which just means design simplicity that makes it comfortable for a variety of hands and a variety of positions. That one, not great affordance. Not great. Check out that one at the end again. Oh, you know what? It's like a cheap handlebar on a bike. It's, it's hollow. It's got a hard surface. It's got weird angles. Testers much preferred something like this that was smooth, that was long it's enough. very comfortable. They could choke up on it or yep. pull back on it for a little more yep. leverage. Julia, you are holding our new winning all-purpose spatula. That is the Dioro Living 
seamless silicone spatula. It's ten dollars and ninety-seven cents. Mm -hmm. It's a great all-purpose spatula. However, I am going to continue to recommend an honorable mention mm -hmm. for our old winner. This is the thirteen and a half inch Rubbermaid high heat scraper. This one has a slightly larger head, so it's great for folding really delicate batters or egg foams, and it's got a longer handle. So if you were reaching into a deep bowl or mm -hmm. pot, this is a good spatula to have on hand too. And you know, it's lasted the test kitchen many years, so it's super durable. We know that, and it's fourteen dollars and fifty cents. All right. So our winning spatula is the Dioro Living Seamless Silicone Spatula for ten dollars. Dollars and ninety-seven cents. The kitchen thermometer is one of the most important tools for a home cook, but only if it's accurate. To test the accuracy, fill a glass with ice, pour water over top, and let it sit for three minutes. Then stick the probe into the water and stir gently, making sure to not touch the edge of the glass. Your thermometer should read 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. If not, adjust your thermometer according to your manufacturer's instructions. I make a lot of sheet cakes at home. They're so quick to put together. Plus you get to frost and serve those cakes right out of the pan. Now sometimes it's a little tempting to make the process even easier by starting off with a box of chocolate cake mix. Don't do it because despite the name, chocolate right there, there's little chocolate flavor. So Erin is here to show us a much better from scratch version. You're gonna be so satisfied with this version, Bridget. Today we're putting the chocolate back into the cake and in the frosting. Bridget. How about that? Absolutely, and it's <laughs> gonna be easy too, I promise. Great. Okay, so let's start over here. I have one and a half cups of sugar. I'm gonna add one and a quarter cups of all-purpose flour, half a teaspoon of salt, and a half a teaspoon of baking soda. I'm just gonna whisk these guys together till it's evenly combined. Now we're gonna move on to our chocolate. Okay. I know you love chocolate, right? I love All chocolate. All right. So first we're gonna start by adding one cup of milk to our saucepan. And I'm gonna add eight ounces of bittersweet chocolate that I chopped up fine. And we're gonna add three quarters of a cup of Dutch processed cocoa powder. A lot of chocolate flavor going into the sauce. We pan. are not holding back here. A lot of recipes actually only call for cocoa powder, and those recipes really are lacking chocolate flavors. The cocoa powder is going to give us really deep chocolate flavor. The fruitiness and bitterness is going to come through. Plus, we're using the bar chocolate to add sugar and fat and more chocolate flavor. Okay, so I'm going to put this over low heat, but I'm just going to whisk it and let it gently melt until it comes together and it's nice and silky and smooth mm. and homogenous. And once it is, I'm going to take it off the heat and let it sit for five minutes. Okay. Okay, Bridget, so our chocolate mixture has melted and it's been sitting here for five minutes cooling. Okay, it's Okay. very smooth. It is very smooth. Are you ready to make our batter? So ready. I'm adding two thirds of a cup of vegetable oil. And that's gonna give us a much cleaner flavor than melted butter or even creamed butter. It is, yep. yes. And we're adding four eggs. And this is the reason we cooled our chocolate mixture because I didn't wanna add the eggs mm. to a hot chocolate mixture. I'm adding one teaspoon of vanilla. Okay, so now I'm just gonna whisk all this together, Bridget. Okay, so now that's all combined. Now I'm gonna go back to our dry ingredients. I'm gonna add the dry ingredients right into the pot and I'm gonna whisk it until it's nicely combined. Now I'm just gonna pour our batter into a nine by 13 pan that's been lightly sprayed with vegetable oil. Okay. So now we're gonna bake this in a 325 degree oven for about 30 to 35 minutes. I'm gonna rotate it halfway through so that it bakes evenly. Okay, Bridget, our cake is in the oven. It's time to make the frosting. Always time to make Always. the frosting. I know it is. <laughs> So we have one pound of milk chocolate. We found that milk chocolate was a great contrast to the dark chocolate cake. So we're gonna melt this over our double boiler. Anytime you set up a double boiler, it's important that the bottom of your bowl does not actually touch the simmering water. Okay. So to this, we're gonna add two thirds of a cup of heavy cream for making an easy ganache. So we're gonna let this melt. It's gonna take about 10 to 15 minutes for the chocolate to melt and I'm gonna whisk it occasionally just until it's nice and smooth and silky. Okay. We knew we were not gonna use canned frosting, so we went with a ganache. It's gonna yield the perfect frosting. And it's easy. And it's easy. Okay, it's been about 10 minutes and our chocolate is melted perfectly. It smells so good in here. That looks nice. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. So dreamy. Do we lose yourself in it? <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm just gonna take the bowl and bring it over here. And now we're gonna add just a little bit of butter. Okay. Just a little bit. 16 tablespoons. Just a tad. Just a tad. <laughs> and this is room temperature butter. I'm gonna let this sit for about five minutes. Okay, so this is nice and creamy and smooth. What do you think? It's beautiful and it's glossy beautiful. and chocolatey. It's like a waterfall. A lot of recipes call for cooling their frostings for about two to three hours. We only need 30 to 60 minutes because we're gonna put it in the fridge. Mmm. <laughs> Look at that beautiful cake. 
So this baked for about 30 minutes or so, and we know that it's finished when you touch the top and it bounces back a little bit. It's slightly firm. The other way of testing is by poking your cake with a little toothpick and some moist crumbs should be attached. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna let the cake cool for one to two hours until we can frost it. Longest time ever. You can do it. You, you can do I it. Can? I do. <laughs> Well, we all love the aroma of chocolate cake wafting from the oven. We can actually smell it in here just a little bit, but in general, the more chocolate you can smell, the less chocolate flavor you're gonna taste. Chocolate is full of volatile flavor compounds, so when heated, the liquid in the batter turns to steam and carries away some of those compounds. And that's why we recommend underbaking chocolate goods just a little bit. Not only is the resulting cake going to be moist, but more of those flavor compounds are gonna be left in the cake right where they belong. So our cake is cooled, our frosting is chilled, and now I'm gonna finish frosting. Time to assemble. Time to assemble. <laughs> so this is cooled for just under an hour, and it's set up just enough, but it's still pliable. Mm. Now I'm just gonna whisk it until it lightens in color and becomes a little softer and smoother. All right, so you can see that it's lightened in color. Beautiful. And it should also hold its shape oh. on a whisk. So now I'm just gonna scoop all this frosting right awesome. into the center of the cake. Yes! So anytime I frost a cake, I always put the frosting in the center of the cake, and then I can work my way up to the edges. Mmm. Now, are you all signing right. your name? This is Aaron's cake. All mine. <laughs> we are ready. Okay. That is beautiful. What's great is nice big pieces. Oh, come on. A really good chocolate cake, you have to taste at least 10 times to make sure it's okay. I heard 12. Mmm. That frosting. Creamy. Soaky. Light. Light. And that cake, mm. the cake, it's sturdy, but it's so moist. And it has like really deep, dark chocolate flavor, doesn't it? You keep talking. Mm-hmm. Well, this amazing cake starts with a batter made right in a saucepan. Melt bittersweet chocolate and Dutch processed cocoa with milk, add vegetable oil and the dry ingredients, then bake that cake. Balance with a ganache frosting made with milk chocolate, heavy cream, and a little bit of butter. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a simple and sophisticated chocolate sheet cake with milk chocolate frosting. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. <laughs> So you're right that this serves 12? <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.